Hi my friends, I am back and we are going to keep reading The City of Ember. So the last time we read, Lena was trying to decode the instructions that she found and she showed it to a couple of different people but nobody seemed to care. And then she thought about Dune and she decided that she is going to go find Dune tomorrow, show him the instructions and see if they can work together to figure out what they mean. So we are going to pick back up with chapter 8, Explorations. Dune had taken to wandering the pipeworks alone. He would go to his assigned tunnel and do his job quickly. Once he got good at using wrenches and brushes and tubes of glue, it wasn't hard. Most of the workers did their jobs quickly, then gathered in little groups to play cards or have salamander races or just talk or sleep. But Dune didn't care about any of that. If he was going to be stuck in the pipeworks, he would at least not waste the time he had. Since the long blackout, everything seemed more urgent than ever. Whenever the lights flickered, he was afraid the ancient generator might be shuddering to a permanent halt. So, while the others lounged around, he headed out toward the edge of the pipeworks to see what he could see. Pay attention, his father had said, and that's what he did. He followed his map when he could, but in some places the map was unclear. There were even tunnels that didn't show up on the map at all. To keep from getting lost, he dropped a trail of things as he walked. Washers, bolts, pieces of wire, whatever he had in his tool belt, and then he picked them up on his way back. His father had been at least a little bit right. There were interesting things in the pipeworks if you paid attention. Already he had found three new crawling creatures, a black beetle the size of a pinhead, a moth with furry wings, and best of all, a creature with a soft, shiny body and a small, spiral-patterned shell on its back. Just after he found this one, while he was sitting on the carpet on the floor watching in fascination as the creature crept up his arm, a couple of workers came by and saw him. They burst into laughter. It's Bug Boy, one of them said. He's collecting bugs for his lunch. Enraged, Dune jumped up and shouted at them. His sudden motion made the creature fall off his arm to the ground, and Dune felt a crunch beneath his foot. The laughing workers didn't notice. They tossed a few more taunts at him and walked on. But Dune knew instantly what he had done. He lifted his foot and looked at the squashed mess underneath. Unintended consequences, he thought miserably. He was angry at his anger, the way it surged up and took over. He picked the bits of shell and goo off the sole of his boot and thought, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to hurt you. In the days that followed, Dune went farther and farther into the pipeworks, holding on to the hope that he might find something not only interesting, but important. But what he found didn't seem important at all. Once he came upon an old pair of pliers that someone had dropped and left behind. Twice he found a coin. He discovered a supply closet that appeared to have been completely forgotten. But all it held were some boxes of plugs and washers and a rusty box containing shriveled bits of what must have once been someone's lunch. He found another supply closet at the far south end of Pipeworks. At least, he assumed that's where it was. It was the end of a tunnel with a rope strung across it. A sign hanging from the rope said, Caved in, no entry. Dune entered anyway, ducking under the rope. He found no sign of a cave-in, but there were no lights. He groped his way forward for twenty steps or so, and there the tunnel ended in a securely locked door. He couldn't see it, but he felt it. He retraced his steps, ducked back under the rope again, and walked on. A short distance away, he found a hatch in the ceiling of the tunnel, a square wooden panel that must lead, he thought, up into the storerooms. If he had had something to stand on, he could have reached it and tried to open it, but it was a foot above his upstretched hand. Probably it was locked anyhow. He wondered if the builders had used openings like this during the construction of the city to get more easily from one place to another. On days when his job was near the main tunnel, he sometimes walked along the river after he had finished working. He stayed away from the east end where the generator was. He didn't want to think about the generator. Instead, he went the other way, toward the place where the river rushed out of the pipeworks. The path grew less level at this end and less smooth. The river here was bordered with clumps of wrinkled rock that seemed to grow out of the ground like fungus. Dune liked to sit on these clumps, running his fingers along the strange creases and crevices that must have been carved somehow by running or dripping water. In some places, there were grooves that looked almost like writing. But as for things of importance, Dune found none. It seemed that the pipeworks were no use after all to a person who wanted to save the city. The generator was hopeless. He would never understand electricity. He used to think he could use electricity to invent a movable light, if he studied hard enough. He took apart light bulbs, he took apart the electric outlets on the wall to see how the wires inside wound together and, in the process, got a painful, vibrating jolt all through his body. But when he tried to wind wires of his own together in exactly the same way, nothing happened. It was what came through the wires that made the light, he finally understood, and he had no idea what it was. Now he could see only two courses of action. He could give up and do nothing, or he could start to work on a different kind of movable light. Dune didn't want to give up. So on his day off one Thursday, he went to the Ember Library to look up fire. 
The library occupied an entire building on one side of Bill Bolio Square. Its door was at the end of a short passage in the middle of the building. Dune went down the passage, pushed open the door, and walked in. No one was there except for the librarian, ancient Edward Pocket, who sat beside her at the desk writing something with a tiny pencil clutched in his gnarled hand. The library had two big rooms, one for fiction, which was stories people made up out of their imaginations, and the other for fact, which was information about the real world. The walls of both rooms were lined with shelves, and on most of the shelves were hundreds of packets of pages. Each packet was held together with stout loops of string. The packets leaned against each other at angles and lay in untidy stacks. Some were thick, and some were so slim that only a clip was needed to hold them together. The pages of the oldest packets were yellowed and warped, and their edges were uneven rows of ripples. These were the Books of Ember, written over the years by its citizens. They contained in their close-written pages much that was imagined and everything that was known. Edward Pocket looked up and nodded briefly at Dune, one of his most frequent visitors. Dune nodded back. He went into the fact room, to the section of shelves labeled F. The books were arranged by subject, but even so, it wasn't easy to find what you wanted. A book about moths, for instance, might be under M for moths, or I for insects, or B for bugs. It might even be under F for flying things. Usually, you had to browse through the entire library to make sure you had found all the books on one subject, but since he was looking for fire, he thought he might as well start with F. Fire was rare in Ember. When there was a fire, it was because there had been an accident. Someone had left a dish towel too close to an electric burner on a stove, or a cord had frayed and a spark had flown out and ignited curtains. Then the citizens would rush in with buckets of water and the fire was quickly drowned. But it was, of course, possible to start a fire on purpose. You could hold a sliver of wood to the stove burner until it burst into flame, and then, for a moment, it would flare blight brightly, giving off orange light. The trick was to find a way to make the light last. If you had a light that would keep going, you could go out into the unknown regions and see what was there. Finding a way to explore the unknown regions was the only thing Dune could think of to do. He took down a book from the F shelf. Fungus, it was called. He put it back. The next book was called How to Repair Furniture. He put that back, too. He went through foot diseases, fun with string, coping with failure, and canned fruit recipes before he finally found a book called All About Fire. He sat down at one of the library square tables to read it. But the person who had written the book knew no more about fire than Dune. Mostly, the book described the dangers of fire. A long section of it was about a building in Winifred Square that had caught fire 40 years ago, and how all its doors and all its furniture had burned up, and smoke had filled the air for days. Another part was about what to do if your oven caught on fire. Dune closed the book and sighed. It was useless. He could write a better book than that. He got up and wandered restlessly around the library. Sometimes you could find useful things just by choosing randomly from the shelves. He had done this many times, just reached out and grabbed something, in the hope that by accident he might come upon the very piece of information he needed. It would be something that another person had written down without understanding its significance, just a sentence or two that could be like a flash of light in Dune's mind, fitting together with things he already knew to make a solution to everything. Although he had often found something interesting in these searches, he'd never found anything important. Today was no different. He did come across a collection called Mysterious Words from the Past, which he read for a while. It was about words and phrases so old that their meanings had been forgotten. He read a few pages. Heavens above indicates surprise. What heavens means is unclear. It might be another word for floodlight. Hogwash means nonsense, though no one knows what a hog is or why anyone would wash it. Batting a thousand indicates great success. This might possibly refer to killing bugs. All in the same boat means all in the same predicament. The meaning of boat is unknown. Interesting, but not useful. He put the book back on the shelf and was about to leave when the door of the library opened and Lena Mayfleet came in. Chapter 9. The Door in the Roped-Off Tunnel Lena saw Dune immediately. He was reaching up to set a book back on its shelf. He saw her too when he turned around and his dark eyebrows flew up in surprise as she hurried over to him. Your father told me you were here, she said. Dune, I found something. I want to show it to you. To me? Why? I think it's important. It has to do with the pipeworks. Will you come to my house and see it? Now? Dune asked. Lena nodded. Dune grabbed his old brown jacket and followed Lena out of the library and across the city to Quilliam Square. Granny's shop was closed and dark when they arrived, and so Lena was surprised when they went upstairs and saw Eveline Murdo sitting in her place by the window. Your grandmother's in her bedroom, Mrs. Murdo said. She didn't feel well, so she asked me to come. Poppy was sitting on the floor, banging a spoon on the leg of a chair. Lena introduced Dune, then led him into the room she shared with Poppy. He looked around, and Lena felt suddenly self-conscious, seeing her room through his eyes. It was a small room with a lot crammed into it. 
There were two narrow beds, a very small table that fit into a corner, and a four-legged stool to sit on. On the wall, clothes hung from hooks, and more clothes were strewn untidily on the floor. Beneath the window was a brown stain made by the bean seed in its pot on the windowsill. Lena had been watering it every night because she'd promised Clara she would, but it was nothing but dirt, flat and unpromising. A couple of shelves beside the window held Lena's important possessions, the pieces of paper she collected for drawing, her pencils, a scarf with a silver thread woven through it. On the parts of the wall that had no hooks and no shelves, she'd pinned up some of her pictures. What are those? Dune asked. They're from my imagination, Lena said, feeling slightly embarrassed. They're pictures of another city. Oh, you made it up. Sort of. Sometimes I dream of it. I draw too, said Dune, but I draw other kinds of things. Like what? Mostly insects, said Dune. He told her about his collections of drawings and the worm he was currently observing. To Lena, this sounded far less interesting than an undiscovered city, but she didn't say so. She led Dune over to the table. Here's what I want to show you, she said. She lifted the metal box. Before she could reach for the papers underneath, Dune took the box and started examining it. Where did this come from? He asked. It was in the closet, Lena said. She told him about Granny's wild search and about finding the box with its lid open and poppy with paper in her mouth. As she talked, Dune turned the box over in his hands, opened and closed its lid, and peered at the latch. There's some sort of odd mechanism here, he said. He tapped at a small metal compartment at the front of the box. I'd like to see inside this. Here's what was in the box, said Lena, lifting the covering paper from her patchwork of scraps. At least, it's what's left of what was in there. Dune bent over, his hands on either side of the paper. Lena said, it's called Instructions for Egriston, or maybe Egrisman. Someone's name, anyhow. Maybe a mayor or guard. I just call it the instructions. I told the mayor about it. I thought maybe it was important. I wrote him a note, but he hasn't answered. I don't think he's interested. Dune said nothing. You don't have to hold your breath, said Lena. I glued the pieces down. Look, she said, pointing. This word must be pipeworks, and this one is river, and look at this one, door. Dune didn't answer. His hair had fallen forward, so Lena couldn't see the expression on his face. I thought at first, Lena went on, that it must be instructions for how to do something, how to fix the electricity, maybe. But then I thought, what if it's instructions for going to another place? Dune said nothing, so Lena went on. I mean, someplace that isn't here, like another city. I think these instructions say go down into the pipeworks and look for a door. Dune brushed the hair back from his face, but he didn't straighten up. He gazed at the broken words and frowned. Edge, he murmured. Small steel pan. What would that mean? A frying pan, said Lena, but I don't know why there would be a frying pan in the pipeworks. But Dune didn't answer. He seemed to be talking to himself. He kept reading, moving a finger along the lines of words. Open, he whispered. Follow. Finally, he turned to look at Lena. I think you're right, he said. I think this is important. Oh, I was sure you would think so, Lena cried. She was so relieved that her words poured out in a rush. Because you take things seriously. You told the truth to the mayor on assignment day. I didn't want to believe it, but then came the long blackout, and I knew, I knew things were as bad as you said. She stopped, breathless. She pointed to a word on the document. This door, she said, it has to be the door that leads out of Ember. I don't know, said Dune. Maybe. Or door that leads to something important, even if it isn't that. But it must be that. What else could be important enough to lock up in a fancy box? Well, I suppose it could be a storage room with some special tools in it or something. A look of surprise came over his face. Actually, I saw a door where I didn't expect to see one, out in Tunnel 351. It was locked. I thought it was an old supply closet. I wonder if that could be it. It must be, cried Lena. Her heart sped up. It wasn't anywhere near the river, Dune said doubtfully. That doesn't matter, Lena said. The river goes through the pipeworks, that's all. It's probably something like go down by the river, then go this way, then that way. Maybe, said Dune. It must be, Lena cried. I know it is. It's the door that leads out of Ember. I don't know if that makes sense, said Dune. A door in the pipeworks could only lean to something underground. And how could that? Lena had no patience for Dune's reasoning. She wanted to dance around the room. She was so excited. We have to find a way out, she said. We have to find out right away. Dune looked startled. Well, I can go and try the door again, he said. It was locked before, but I suppose... I want to go too, said Lena. You want to come down into the pipeworks? Yes. Can you get me in? Dune thought for a moment. I think I can. If you just come just at quitting time and wait outside the door, I'll stay out of sight until everyone is gone. Then I'll let you in. Tomorrow? Okay, tomorrow. Lena stopped at home the next day only long enough to change out of her messenger jacket, and then she danced across, dashed across town to the pipeworks. Dune met her just outside the door, and she followed him inside, where he handed her a slicker and boots to put on. They descended the long stone stairway, and when they came out into the main tunnel, Lena stood still, staring at the river. 
I didn't know the river was so big, she said, after she found her voice. Yes, said Doom. Every few years, they say, someone falls in. And if you fall in, there's no hope of fishing you out. The river swallows you up and sweeps you away. Lena shivered. It was cold down here, a cold that she felt all the way through. Cold flesh, cold blood, cold bones. Doom led her up the path beside the water. After a while, they came to an opening in the wall, and they turned into it and left the river behind. Doom led the way through the winding tunnels. Their rubber boots splashed in pools of water on the floor. Lena thought how awful it would be to work down here all day, every day. It was a creepy place, a place where it seemed people didn't belong. That black river, it was like something in a bad dream. You have to duck here, said Doom. They had come to a roped off tunnel. But there's no light in there, Lena said. No, said Doom. We have to feel our way. It isn't far. He ducked under the rope and went in, and Lena did the same. They stepped forward into the dark. Lena kept a hand against the damp wall and placed her feet carefully. It's right here, said Dune. He had stopped a few feet ahead of Lena. She came up behind him. Put your hands out, he said. You'll feel it. Lena felt a smooth, hard surface. There was a round metal knob, and below the knob, a keyhole. It seemed like an ordinary door, not at all like the entrance to a new world. But that was what made things so exciting. Nothing was ever how you expected it to be. Let's try it, she whispered. Dune took hold of the knob and twisted. Locked, he said. Is there a pan anywhere? A pan? The instruction said small steel pan. Maybe that would have the key in it. They felt around, but there was nothing. Just the rocky walls. They patted the walls. They put their ears to the door. They jiggled the knob and pulled it and pushed it. Finally, Dune said, well, we can't get in. Best guess we'd better go. And that was when they heard the noise. It was a scuffling, scraping noise that seemed to be coming from somewhere nearby. Lena stopped breathing. She clutched Dune's arm. Quick, Dune whispered. He made his way back toward the lighted tunnel with Lena following. They ducked under the rope and rounded a turn, then stopped, stood still, and listened. A harsh scraping sound, a thud, a pause, and then the sound of an impact, a short, explosive breath, and a muttered word in a gruff, low voice. Then, slow footsteps, getting closer. They flattened themselves against the wall and stood motionless. The footsteps stopped briefly, and there was another grunt. Then, the steps continued, but seemed to be fading. In a moment, from a distance, there was another sound, the chink of a key turning in a lock, and the click of a latch opening. Lena made an astonished face at Dune. Someone had gone down the rope tunnel and opened the door. She put her mouth close to Dune's ear. Shall we try to see who it is, she whispered. Dune shook his head. I don't think we should, he said. We should go. We could just peek around the corner. It was too tempting not to try. They crept forward to the place where the tunnel turned. From there, they could see the entrance to the rope tunnel. Holding their breath, they watched, and in a minute, they heard a thump and a click, the door closing, the lock turning, and footsteps once again, this time quick. A long leg stepped over the rope, and the person it belonged to turned and walked away. All they saw was his back, a dark coat, dark, untidy hair. He walked with a lurching motion that struck Lena as somehow familiar. In a few seconds, he had vanished into the shadows. When they came up out of the pipeworks, they stripped off their boots and slickers and hurried out into Plummer Square, where they flopped down on a bench and burst into furious talk. Someone got there before us, said Lena. Dune said, he was walking slowly when he went in, as if he was looking for something, and he walked fast when he came out. As if he'd found something. What was it? I can't stand not to know. Dune jumped up. He paced back and forth in front of the bench. But how did he get a key? He asked. Did he find instructions like the one you found? And how did he get into the pipeworks? I don't think he works there. There's something familiar about the way he walks, said Lena, but I don't know why. Well, anyhow, he opened that door and we can't, said Dune. If it does go somewhere, if it does lead out of Ember, he'll be telling the whole city pretty soon. He'll be a hero. Dune sat down again. If he's found the way out, we'll be glad, of course, he said glumly. It doesn't matter who finds it, as long as it helps the city. That's right, Lena said. It's just that I thought we were going to find it, said Dune. Yes, Lena said thinking how grand it would have been to stand before all of Ember announcing their discovery. They sat without talking for a while, lost in their own thoughts. A man pulling a cart full of wood scraps went by. A woman leaned from a lighted window on Gappery Street and called out to some boys playing in the square below. A couple of guards with their red and brown uniforms ambled across the square laughing. The town clock rang out six deep booms that Lena could feel, like shutters beneath her ribs. Dune said, I guess what we do now is wait and see if there's an announcement. I guess so, said Lena. Maybe that door is nothing special after all, said Dune. Maybe it's just an old, unused supply closet. But Lena wasn't ready to believe that. Maybe there wasn't a door out of Ember, but it was a mystery nevertheless. A mystery connected, she was sure, to the bigger mystery that they were trying to solve.
All right, so that is where we're going to stop for today. So I cannot wait to keep reading with you guys and see if Dune and Lena are able to solve the mystery and what that door has to do with anything. So stay tuned for tomorrow's video and we will hopefully find out. Bye guys.